Hello everybody, I am Professor Judith Gray and I'm from the University of Buckingham and in this short lecture today I want to examine the law on lost and found objects and the law of treasure and to discuss how they relate to our study of land law. One of the surprising aspects of our early studies of land law is the width and the definition of land. It includes the land itself, it includes the airspace above and the land beneath the ground. It also includes buildings and structures. But somewhat surprisingly, it includes objects found buried in the land and found on the surface. Now, of course, any discussion assumes that those objects are truly lost and the true owner cannot be located. What I want to examine briefly is the law on lost objects and also the basis on which the Crown can step in and claim objects of value that we know as treasure. The starting point for our discussion is the fact that no object can be ownerless. Objects must have an owner and if there is no owner then a substitute owner must be found. We often talk in land law about gradations of ownership. We talk about absolute and relative rights. In Roman law, you have absolute rights of property, whereas in English law, we talk about relative rights. So if one is, say, a, a watch or a gold brooch has been lost, then the rights of the true owner will gradually diminish until we get to the stage where a substitute owner must be found. As Lord Justice Old stated in the case of Waverley and Fletcher, we apply principles of priority of entitlement. The substitute owner will come from a limited group, the landowner and the finder, and then maybe the employer of the finder, or a superior landowner if the finder or the landowner was a tenant, such as the freeholder, and then possibly extend to the crown. The rights of a landowner to claim lost objects are based on common law principles and also to some extent statutes, such as Section 205 of the Law of Property Act 1925. It depends on a number of factors. Location will always be relevant. The law draws a distinction between those objects resting on the surface of the land and also those objects found buried in the land. Objects buried in the ground will require some interference with the land. So any finder must have permission to dig or otherwise there will be a trespasser. If the finder has that permission to dig, then the law must consider whether or not the finder had permission to take away any objects that were found located in the land. By contrast, a finder will have a much stronger claim to any objects found resting on the surface. The landowner may also have a claim according to the well-known case of Parker and British Airways Board, but only if he has exerted control over the land as well as uh, any lost objects. I often wonder what this tells us about the law's attitude to land ownership. It seems to suggest that ownership must be active. Simply to own the land is not enough, but some positive demonstration that you as a landowner are constantly reviewing the extent to which you can claim rights is required. In Parker, the landowners could not claim a lost object found in an executive lounge at Heathrow Airport because they could not demonstrate that they had control over the land and over lost objects. The line draw was very narrow indeed. The case turned on whether the lost property policy had been published to the public as well as the employees. In the view of the judge, it was the publicising of that policy to the public that demonstrated that they exerted control over the land. Where a lost object comes within the definition of treasure, the group of claimants will extend to the crown. Location of the object is less important. Everything depends on whether it comes within the definition of treasure as laid down in the Treasure Act 
1996, Section 1. The Crown has always had a strong claim on objects made of precious metal. As Bracton stated in the 13th century, gold and silver artefacts, coin and bullion, belonged to the Crown until the true owner had made his claim. At that time, it was also relevant as to whether or not the object had been hidden with the intention to recover. Of course, um, intention to recover and concealment was always difficult to prove. At best, it was circumstantial. And even if the um, ground had not been disturbed for centuries, then evidence of deliberate concealment was always going to be equivocal. For centuries, the Crown was much more interested in the monetary value of the object. Indeed, it usually would melt down any objects found to provide revenue. And it wasn't until the 19th century, with the growth of academic research, that it was accepted that these objects might be of value in their own right. The law in England and Wales is essentially a law of treasure. Whereas the law in many other jurisdictions, such as Malta and Cyprus, and closer to home, Scotland and Ireland, is a law of antiquities, where the emphasis is much more on the historical and archaeological value. There was an attempt in the House of Lords in 1981 to introduce an antiquities bill, in line with other countries, but this failed. So what we have is the Treasurer, 1996, with its emphasis on precious metal and groups of coins. For the land lawyer, then the question that needs to be examined is if we accept that the landowner may have a claim to lost objects, in what circumstances can, then can the Crown step in and supersede that right? The logic behind the claim of the Crown was held that if the true owner had hidden an object, such as a pouch of coins intending to recover, but had died, then no one knows of that hidden object and the Crown would have a prerogative right to make a claim as substitute owner because the object had not been lost and the Crown claims on behalf of the deceased. So by contrast, if an object had been lost, say a ring from the finger of a Roman soldier as he marched along Watling Street, that object had been returned to the common stock of lost objects and the Crown no longer had a superior claim and the question would be decided by the law on lost objects. The problem with that distinction was that a number of very valuable objects were lost to the nation. And just one example would be the mold gold cape, as highlighted by Neil McGregor in his book, A Hundred Objects, A History of the World in A Hundred Objects. It was clearly lost, and it was a very valuable object. It was found by a group of workmen working in North Wales on a hillside. And what they decided to do was chop it up and split it between them. And they each took their part away. And it was not until some years later that a historian discovered what had happened and he was gradually able to piece those pieces together. And it is now on display in the British Museum. But what was lost was the context of the object and the light that it would have shed on the civilization in North Wales 4,000 years ago. The Treasure Act at least avoids the difficult distinction between genuinely lost objects and those concealed for later retrieval. The definition in the Treasure Act, Section 1, concentrates on age, objects of in excess of 300 years, and precious metal content. So it includes objects that, um, that are 300 years old with 10% metal content, groups of coins also of the same age and same metal, um, precious metal content, but it also includes groups of 10 or more coins of base metal. And one or two objects may be within the definition, for instance, if an object or a group of coins was found in a pottery jar, that pottery jar would become treasure by connection. Now that's a very legalistic definition. 
because if you found eight coins of base metal, they would be out with the section. If you found a single gold coin, that would not be within the section. And so it has been criticised, and in 2019, proposals were made for reform, which would include making the date more flexible, including um, objects with a value in excess of £10,000 that were not made of precious metal coming within the definition, and it would also extend to single gold coins. So there are a number of proposals which are still under consideration. If these proposals had been in operation, then a number of objects that had not been declared as treasure would have come within that definition. One such example is the Crosby Garrett helmet found in Cumbria. And this is a helmet which is a Roman helmet, just one of ten in the entire world, but it was made of bronze. So when it was found, it was outside the section and it was possible for a private owner to buy that. So again, what is lost is the possibility to examine that helmet and to see it on display in a public museum. Now the Act has had successes, mainly due to two sections, one providing a discretionary reward and the second imposing criminal sanctions for failure to declare that an object of treasure has been found. Um, the promise of the reward has been a real incentive to amateur metal detectorists. For instance, an Anglo-Saxon hoard was found in 2009 and this was an incredibly valuable hoard, including artefacts and jewellery, which shed light on life in Anglo-Saxon um, life, which was quite unknown before. And the finder shared with the landowner a reward of £2.4 million. By contrast, there have been very few criminal prosecutions. The first was in 2010, and the, um, sec the sentence imposed was a conditional discharge for the um, failure to report a small object. Um, in 2019, there was a serious criminal prosecution, and I think it is that case, the successful prosecution, that sheds light on the modern basis of the Crown's claim to treasure. The defendants failed to report a valuable Viking hoard, including jewellery and crowns, worth several million pounds. And together they were sentenced to 10 years and eight and a half years imprisonment. Many of the objects have still not been recovered. In passing sentence, the judge told the defendants that they had cheated the farmer, cheated the landowner, and also the public because the treasure belongs to the nation and the benefit to the nation is that these items cannot be seen and admired by others and examined by experts. So this brings us back to the question of how do the law on lost and found objects and the law on treasure fit with our study of land law and landowners' rights? Finding a substitute for the true owner of a lost object involves weighing up various claims and prioritising rights. Where objects lie embedded in the land, then the rights of the landowner are prioritised, irrespective of whether he actually knows that they are there. Where an object is on the land, then the claim is more tenuous, and as Kevin Gray so aptly states, the mere nominal or metaphysical possession of the land by the occupier is an insufficient ground of claim to the chattel, and it must be reinforced by some clear evidence of territorial sovereignty. But any claim by a landowner or a finder can be trumped by the Crown if it is treasure. And this ancient right is rather different today. It's moved away from the belief that the Crown has a right to historical objects as if it was any other landowner. And it's moved towards the idea that the Crown owns objects of treasure on behalf of the nation and not on behalf of itself as part of our national heritage. So perhaps what that tells us 
is that the law today has moved away from a law of treasure to a law of antiquities. Thank you.